On behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies and on behalf of the Middle East Discussion Group, the two co-sponsors for tonight's event, I'd like to welcome everyone here today um, um, for Norman Finkelstein's lecture on the Israel-Palestine peace process. I was asked to announce that um, most of Norman's recent books are on sale uh, at the back of the room. He'll be happy to sign them after the event, should you be interested in purchasing um, a copy of the book. Just a brief word also about our Center for Middle East Studies, because we're still fairly new, um, about a year and a half old. We were sort of set up to raise the quality and quantity of discussion and debate here um, at the University of Denver, Denver with respect to the Middle East. And in keeping with that sort of mission, we have a very ambitious uh, series of events that we are um, hosting over the course of this spring quarter, um, this event being one of them. Um, uh, if you're interested in finding out more about our forthcoming events, there's, our, there's flyers by the main door where you can find more information or you can send us an email to get put on our um, email list. There's one particular event that I think uh, will be of particular interest to this audience. Uh, on May the 13th, uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar from the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies will be here uh, for a series of lectures. On the evening of May the 13th, he'll be talking about his book, um, The Arabs and the Holocaust, The Arab-Israel War of Narratives. Um, um, and so since um, there's an overlap between that event and this event, I wanted to highlight that particular event, um, which might be of interest to uh, some of the members of tonight's um, audience. Um, there's also another event I was asked to announce tomorrow. There's a faculty discussion about um, the state of human rights in Iraq um, after the um, 2003 American invasion. It's about foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, human rights in Iraq, taking place tomorrow afternoon uh, in Sturm Hall uh, at 2 in the afternoon. There's also another flyer, I believe, with that uh, details on that event um, tomorrow, um, if you want more information. Um, and I think that's all I was supposed to announce, unless any of my colleagues in the Center for Middle East Studies want to sort of um, indicate that I've forgotten something. But that's, um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, what I wanted to say in terms of introductory remarks. In terms of introducing Norman Finkelstein, um, one of our colleagues here, my colleague at uh, the Joseph Corbell School, Rob Prince, who's affiliated with our Center for Middle East Studies and has been very active on the Israel-Palestine conflict in this city for, what, at least 30, 40 years? Um, longer than that? <laughs> Um, um, knows Norman's work um, extremely well, and I've asked him to sort of um, prepare some introductory remarks and give Norman a formal introduction. Hello. Um, welcome, Norman. Welcome. Uh, I want to uh, thank, first of all, the Center for Middle East studies, and also the, it's the Middle East Discussion Group, which is a student group, for, um, for hosting Norman and for sponsoring this event. Um, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say about Norman Finkelstein. Um, I really don't know him personally very well. I know him through his work. And he is, to my mind, first and foremost, a first-class scholar. Um, with a fine, probing mind, and something else, and that is a profound and enduring sense of ethics. That combination, serious scholarship and ethics, is uh, the academic version of an endangered species, more <laughs> and more. <laughs> uh, I will read from how WikiLeaks describes Norman uh, a little bit. I assume that, that most of you are familiar with Norman, but uh, some of you aren't. An American political scientist, activist, professor, and author. His primary, field of research, uh, re his primary fields of research are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the politics of the Holocaust, um, an interest motivated by the experiences of his parents, who were Jewish Holocaust survivors. Uh, his works include The Holocaust Industry, The Rise and Fall of Palestine, Beyond Chutzpah, uh, the, the Misuse of Anti-Semitism and the Abuse of History, What Gandhi Says About Nonviolence, a new book, Old Wine, Broken Bottle. You going to tell us a little bit about that? No? Okay. Um, 
And uh, I said, which perhaps he'll tell us about, but I guess that he won't. Um, I, I have read a great deal of his work and listened to um, a fair number of his interviews. I have a personal favorite, and that is when he debated Martin Indyke on Democracy Now! Um, and if you Google that, it would be worth seeing. Um, I myself, uh, I don't have mentors. If anything, uh, I have anti-mentors. I think of what my anti-mentors would do. I do the opposite. And that has gotten me through life uh, pretty well, <laughs> all right? But having said that, there are a few American intellectuals that have really shown the way to a whole generation of activists on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of them is Noam Chomsky, who spoke, here a few year, who spoke here a few years ago. And the other, to my mind, is Norman Finkelstein. And they have provided us with what I consider to be invaluable services. First of all, they have deconstructed this Israeli Palestinian conflict and explained it in a new way, a more honest way. They've explained something else, which is often missing from these discussions, and that is the dynamics of what the United States is up to in the Middle East. And finally, they have, perhaps after some Jewish wanderings in the wilderness, offered their visions of a viable alternative to the crisis, what I would call one based on practical idealism. With that, please join me in welcoming Norman Finkelstein. Well, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I've been here, I guess, now this is the third day. I was in Colorado Springs, and then this morning, Professor Hashimi drove me here. And it's really quite beautiful. I had to, uh, or I wanted to lecture, not lecture, teach a course this afternoon on Plato's Republic. Most of you know the Republic has been probably the first attempt at a describing a utopia in the Western tradition. And the one thing that Plato left out, the one thing that Plato left out was where to situate his republic. And after coming to Colorado, I think I know where it ought to be. <laughs> it's really physically breathtaking. And also the quality of the air, the space, it's really very special. I can't quite understand why people, I honestly can't understand why people would prefer New York to Colorado, uh, unless for the arts, but otherwise this is much preferable, I think. Uh, I have a personal obligation, and that's uh, one I'm happy to uh, carry out, which is to thank Professor Hashimi for arranging all this. I've known him for more years than I care to think. It's probably close to 30 years now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, we argue quite forcefully on many issues. And it's often the case, I think, this marks the end of the friendship. Uh, and more to Nader's initiative than my own, um, it's that the friendship stays alive and he takes kinds of risks with which professors who are much better placed and who claim to have the same politics as him uh, wouldn't take. So I have to respect that and I have to, I feel an obligation which I'm happy to fulfill uh, of publicly acknowledging it. Uh, I won't be speaking on my new little book. I'm trying to keep my books shorter now because I'm trying to reach the younger generation and reading is not a vocation among youth. Uh, I, so the last one book I wrote recently was very large, unfortunately, and the sales reflected that fact. Um, but I did write two shorter books, and the most recent one 
comes in at under 100 pages, which I was uh, very pleased with. Um, I was in the UK recently, and I mentioned to some young people that it was for your generation. It comes in under 100 pages. And one fellow said, well, if it's for our generation, it has to come in under 140 characters, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is a challenge. It's just so far you can go in compressing your thoughts. I think most of my footnotes are more than 140 characters. Um, the reason I mention it just in a strictly biographical and personal note, which is probably of little interest to most of you, is I first sort of, if we can use the expression, made my name uh, 30 years ago this month uh, when I exposed a major literary hoax on the Israel Palestine, scholarly hoax on the Israel Palestine conflict by a woman, allegedly by this woman named Joan Peters. Uh, and the book was called From Time Immemorial. Um, and that book came out in May 1984. It was 30 years ago this month. Uh, and uh, the book I just wrote, the little book I just wrote, it also deals with disinformation on the Israel-Palestine conflict, but of a more sophisticated kind by this Israeli author, Ari Shavit, who had a bestseller in the US called um, My Promised Land. Uh, the fact that it was a very different kind of disinformation reflects how far we've traveled in the last 30 years. Uh, back in 1984, you can write books which pretend that Palestine was empty on the eve of Zionist colonization, the Jews made the desert bloom, and then all these Arabs from neighboring countries surreptitiously entered Palestine and pretended to be Palestinian. That was the book, it was a big bestseller, it was endorsed by all the leading lights in the uh, Jewish intellectual establishment. It happened to have been a complete hoax. Uh, nowadays, if you take Ari Shavit's book, he starts out by saying, uh, well, Israelis expelled the people from Lead and committed massacres in the course of the expulsion in 1948. So it's a very different, uh, point of departure, it acknowledges a large number of, and I use it in quotes, it acknowledges a large number of sins committed by Israel at its founding, uh, and then attempts to justify what was done. Uh, but the important fact is people know a lot more now. The sorts of lies, the sorts of disinformation, the sorts of in misinformation that you could get away with when I first got involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict, that's all long past. It's impossible nowadays for American Jews either to be blind to, to pretend to be blind to, a large part of the historical record. And I think most American Jews are now having even a very hard time trying to rationalize what happened. You can acknowledge it and then try to rationalize it. I think a lot of American Jews now are having trouble even rationalizing it. And that was the subject of that large book I mentioned earlier, uh, the um, knowing too much why the American Jewish romance with Israel is coming to an end. Uh, but that's not why you came, and that's not what was my point, my purpose in being here. Uh, most of you want to know what the heck is going on right now. Uh, and in fact, things are unfolding at a fairly rapid pace, and I haven't had a chance to assimilate uh, the most recent developments, namely the unity agreement that was signed between uh, the Islamic movement Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, that's new news, and my email box was filled this morning with uh, a dozen or so different analyses, uh, which I've had a, time, a chance to read, but I haven't had a chance, as I said, to assimilate. Uh, but that doesn't, in my opinion, change the bigger picture. There are, so to speak, larger forces at work, and there is a bigger context to try to understand everything that's been happening, in particular the last few months, uh, starting in July of this past year, when uh, Secretary of State John Kerry launched his initiative, uh, allegedly to 
not allegedly, initiative to find a resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it's that which I'm going to try to address this evening uh, and hopefully shed some light. And also because I, I'm, I've been around long enough to know movement type people and activist type people, and I could see a lot of them are in the audience. Uh, you can usually tell by all sorts of things, how they dress, color of hair, beards, there's all sorts of giveaways. Uh, have you been around long enough? And there's a, there's a fair share of that genre, shall we call it, uh, in the audience today. Uh, so I'd like to, of course, also discuss practical issues, the nuts and bolts of what to do now in order to try to achieve a just and lasting peace. So what is going on? Um, in fact, uh, it looked at least until quite recently, and I'm not convinced things have significantly changed, that the Palestine conflict was at a crossroads uh, and that it was quite possible, I'm not going to use the past tense, I'll use the present, it's quite possible that uh, John Kerry will succeed in inflicting a historic defeat on the Palestinian struggle for justice. Um, the question is, how did this all come about and where did it come from? What is its content and where is it going? And those are basically my, my um, uh, items to address in this talk this afternoon. The first thing to say is that if you had um, said a, a year ago that Secretary of State John Kerry was about to embark on this mission to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict, most people, including myself, would have reacted with incredulity. Uh, obviously, the Obama administration has a very full plate right now. You might even say a very full table right now. Uh, there is the issue of Russia, uh, broadly speaking, but in particular now the question of the Ukraine. There was the talk back then of the what was called the Asian pivot, where the Obama administration would focus more uh, closely on the developments in Asia, in particular uh, China's um, rise to power. Uh, there was, of course, Syria, there was Iraq, there was Afghanistan. Uh, uh, and these are all pressing issues. These were urgent issues. And beyond that, uh, it was clear that at least at the beginning, that when Bo Obama began his second term of office, that he wanted to focus on domestic issues and establish some sort of domestic record of which he can look back with a certain amount of pride. So when you see this very full foreign policy agenda, and on top of it, the fact that Obama wanted to focus on domestic issues, it is a question, why did uh, uh, Kerry decide to turn his attention and invest a huge amount of time and energy in the Israel-Palestine conflict? Uh, and so, as I said, a year ago, the whole thing would have seemed almost, uh, it would have almost have been bewildering. Uh, but now, in a, when you look in hindsight, uh, it's not all that surprising what happened. <clears throat> the first point to keep in mind, <clears throat> as most of you know, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as most of you know, Kerry is not the first high-ranking U.S. official who uh, attempted to resolve the conflict. The best known effort for most people in this room, uh, the best known effort is the one that was made uh, by uh, President, Jim, um, President uh, Clinton in 2000. Uh, the motive of Clinton uh, in his attempt, his endeavor in 2000, the motive of him, even though it's rarely talked about, the motive was very clear. Clinton had reached the end of his presidency, it was 2000 and he was um, attempting to remove from his legacy the stain of the Monica Lewinsky affair. And he thought that by resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict, it would uh, vindicate his historical, uh, uh, his le what's called you know, the presidential legacy. Uh, and in fact, he invested a huge amount in, in the uh, attempt to resolve the conflict. He's an extremely smart man. Uh, and uh, he applied his uh, mind and his, his intelligence and his energy to resolving the conflict. Uh, there were reports that uh, at a certain point he had learned every single uh, block and alleyway in Jerusalem, 
in trying to resolve the issue of how to divide Jerusalem. Um, and uh, he um, came pretty close. It's often forgotten that by the time he presented what were called in December 2000, what were called the Clinton parameters uh, for resolving the conflict, um, that uh, it seemed as if our, uh, the PLO chair, Yasser Arafat, it seemed as if he was going to capitulate. The pressure exerted on him by Clinton was quite significant, and uh, it was only uh, uh, Arafat's justified recalcitrance that prevented basically a Palestinian capitulation to the Israeli agenda. It's also often forgotten that the Palestinians paid a big price for that. Clinton had promised uh, Yasser Arafat that if the negotiations did not result in an agreement, he wouldn't pin responsibility on any party to the negotiations. Well, he reneged on that promise, and he pinned responsibility squarely on the Palestinians. And that has traveled around with them. Even to this day, it's said that uh, the Palestinians were responsible for the breakdown of the Camp David negotiations in 2000, which is, fla is factually just a lie. Um, but uh, that's, that was the result uh, for the Palestinians of defying Clinton. Uh, and the next major effort comes in 2008. It's probably less well known to most people in the audience, though just as, in many ways, just as significant. Uh, the Secretary of State at the time was Condoleezza Rice. Uh, she was uh, George Bush's Secretary of State. And uh, like, Clint like Clinton, she was concerned about her legacy. Uh, the George, George Bush's foreign policy record was a complete disaster, and she was the, far, the Secretary of State, and so she was going to have to bear the burden of that legacy of George Bush. And she still had very big aspirations, aspirations which may still be realized if she decides to run for president in the Republican Party. Uh, <clears throat> and so she wanted to vindicate her record, and she basically made a deal with Bush, uh, uh, President Bush and the deal went something to the effect of, let me try to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict in order to, I can walk away with some achievement, because there was no achievement uh, from the George Bush uh, years. Uh, if you read, for example, the memoirs of all the leading figures in the Bush administration, uh, which I have read, uh, whether it's Cheney, Rice, Rumsfeld, uh, the, whole, the whole bunch of them, the big achievement they all cite is Afghanistan. And as you could see, looking back now, Afghanistan doesn't look like a very big achievement. That was the best they can do. Uh, and she, re or she realized there's a real problem here. And basically, Bush said, gave her a free hand and said, uh, if you want to try it, go ahead and try. I'm not going to do anything. But if you want to make an attempt at it, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, she, didn't, she didn't accomplish very much in those negotiations, uh, in, in, in part. And I'm not trying to disparage her. Uh, but she was clearly in over her head. Uh, she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, just from a factual point of view, we know that because uh, one of probably the only positive outcome of those Annapolis negotiations in 2008 was there was a disgruntled Palestinian negotiator who was party to those negotiations. And he ended up just releasing the whole record of the negotiations, all the transcripts, and actually parts of the record that go back to 2000. And so you had a record which runs between, uh, I would say between 10 and 15,000 pages. I have it all printed out in my, um, one of my um, storage cabinets. And uh, I'm still astonished to this day just how huge this file is. Uh, most people have not read it at all and some have read it just for bits and pieces. Uh, I have plowed through it, and it's enormous, enormously interesting. Uh, and in the case of Condoleezza Rice, you could see, as I said, she was in over her head. Uh, there, were point, there were points where somebody remarked that we have to resolve the issue of water. And she said, 
is there a water problem in this region? Well, <laughs> Condoleezza, no. <coughs> it's time to change fields. Um, so uh, she made the attempt. Uh, it was unsuccessful. Uh, but as you can see, a pattern is beginning to unfold. And the pattern is uh, US officials using the Israel-Palestine conflict and seeking a resolution for mostly issues of personal vanity, vainglory, ego, and so forth, uh, but with no major US foreign policy interests at stake. And the same thing is true, I think, in the case of uh, Secretary of State Kerry. Uh, he is now burdened with uh, President Obama's foreign policy record which with each passing day is appearing to be more and more disastrous. And it's the end of Kerry's career. He has an ego of significant dimensions. And uh, he doesn't want to cap his political career having to bear the legacy of this uh, Obama administration. Uh, and so I think uh, he's doing exactly what President Clinton attempted to do and what Condoleezza Rice attempted to do, uh, namely try to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, compensate for the multiple policy failures of the Obama administration, maybe get a Nobel Peace Prize, and maybe even, it's speculated, uh, make another run for the presidency. Uh, the irony is, I'm suggesting is, the irony is He's made a huge investment of time and energy. Obama has joined Kerry in this undertaking. And if they do succeed in ending the conflict, it will not be because a critical American interest is at stake. Quite the contrary, the principal impetus behind the US initiative, and it's sort of embarrassing to the president and his secretary of state, and it's very deflating to the rest of us who like to think there are big cosmic forces at issue or at stake. Um, basic issue, I think, is personal vanity. Uh, but personal vanity, if it's harnessed to a powerful state, can inflict a lot of damage. And it can, I think, in this case. Um, the next question is, if that's the motive, uh, What's the content? What exactly is Kerry trying to sell? Uh, there has been no, not yet, uh, Kerry has not uh, released his framework for peace or the principles for resolving the conflict. But in this case, I think we can rely on what's been said widely. Namely, there will be no surprises. If you listen to the uh, language of all of, Ke of Kerry, his advisors, his spokespersons, and so forth, they all repeat the same statement. And the statement goes something to the effect of, quote, everyone knows how the conflict will end. And in fact, that's true. Uh, there is a consensus within the US government, within American officials, about how to resolve the conflict. And the terms of the consensus are perfectly clear, as is their origin. What is the origin of the US consensus? The origin is, as I said, uh, all you have to do is go back and look at those uh, transcripts of the Annapolis negotiations. If you look at the transcripts of the Annapolis negotiations, Israel has its bottom line, its core demands. It will not go below these core demands. And the Palestinians have, at least in the negotiations, they had their bottom line and core demands. Kerry was smart enough to know that you can't win a war by fighting on two fronts. He can't be arguing both with the Palestinians and the Israelis. And he did exactly as one might predict. He adopted the Israeli core demands as the, Israeli, as the American position. And then the basic goal of his mission then was to try to impose the bottom line core demands of Israel on the uh, Palestinians. What are the bottom line core demands of the Israelis? Uh, if you look, as I said, at the negotiations, they're perfectly clear. Israel wants to keep approximately 10% of the West Bank, the area behind the wall that it's been building 
over the last, uh, now it's uh, 12 years. Uh, and those, the wall, the route of the wall, which incorporates about 10% of the West Bank, that'll incorporate about 75 to 85% of the illegal Jewish settlers within Israel. Uh, if they succeed in incorporating the wall, it'll mean that Israel will get some of the most arable land in the West Bank. Israel will get uh, the critical water resources in the West Bank. Israel will get almost all of uh, East Jerusalem. And the wall, as, it's con as the route of it is uh, presently conceived, the wall will trisect the West Bank. Uh, it will bisect it at the waist from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, with the settlement block, the settlement block called Malay Adumim. And then it will also bisect the northern sector uh, by what's called the two fingers of Ariel and Sh Shamran. And so basically, you don't have to be a geographer uh, to grasp that if Israel succeeds in this particular venture of its, uh, which is the Israeli bottom line and is now the the U.S. position, uh, nothing will really will remain of the West Bank. It's very hard to quantify terms like a viable Palestinian state, uh, and you can always make the argument that however small the Palestinian state will be, there's, also, there's always a smaller state in the world, which technically it's true. I mean, we have to be honest about that. But the fact of the matter is uh, everybody who is knowledgeable on the topic recognizes that if this uh, Israeli plan is implemented, uh, nothing will remain of the West Bank, and it will simply at some point be confederated with Jordan, uh, and Palestine will just disappear from the map. Uh, that's the first core demand of Israel, which the Kerry plan has adopted. Uh, and the second bottom line is the nullification, the annulment, of the Palestinian right of return, uh, that the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian refugees, uh, and the succeeding generations, uh, they'll have to accept uh, one of three uh, possibilities. Uh, the three possibilities are uh, typically uh, one is what's called um, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation means wherever the Palestinians presently live they turn the refugees into tolerable housing. That's the rehabilitation option. The second option is resettlement. That means putting the Palestinians in some third country, as it's called. Um, and the third option is repatriation, uh, but repatriation not to Israel, except for a token number, probably in an area of several thousand, uh, but repatriation, again, uh, probably a token number into that prospective Palestinian state, which won't even be a Palestinian <coughs> state. Uh, but the actual right of return under international law, that actual right of return will be annulled, and Israel, in addition, will accept no uh, historical, moral, or legal responsibility for what the Palestinians endured in 1948, and then again, several hundred thousand in 1967. And those are the terms. Uh, you can judge the terms against many different standards. Let me just reiterate, those terms constitute two things. They constitute, judging by the uh, documentary record, what Israel's bottom line is, its core demands, and it also constitutes the Kerry Plan. Um, it's very easy to prove. You can just prove it, by the way, by looking at who Kerry's uh, advisors are and looking at what they have written, what their plans are. People like uh, Dan Kurtzer has presented a plan. Uh, Indic, Martin Indyk is very clear on what the terms are. And again, they're all just an echo of Israel's bottom line. Um, so as I said, you can judge the bottom line against many standards. I'll use the standard which seems to me to be most reasonable. Let's judge the bottom line of the Kerry Plan against what international law allows for, requires, declares, validates. Uh, under international law, um, there's a broad consensus, uh, most recently codified in the 2004 advisory opinion 
of the International Court of Justice. Uh, we're now heading, incidentally, towards the, the tenth year, the, de the decade anniversary of that International Court opinion. It will be in July 2014. Um, the International Court of Justice says that under international law, the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, and the whole of East Jerusalem are occupied Palestinian territories designated, the designate, designated unit of Palestinian self-determination. Uh, the second thing the court ruled was that under international law, all the settlements that Israel has built are illegal under international law. Uh, and then if you look at the issue of the question of the refugees, all the leading human rights organizations in the world, um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the ones you are most familiar with, they have all taken a formal position, a policy position, stating that under international law, the Palestinian refugees and succeeding generations who have maintained genuine links with the land, that they have the right of return under international law. That was the position taken by Human Rights Watch in 2000, and it was also the position taken by Amnesty International in 2001. Uh, so if you judge the Israeli core demands and also the Kerry plan against the standard of international law, uh, Israel uh, wins everything and the Palestinians lose everything. Uh, some people don't like this sort of calculation. They call it zero-sum thinking. But in fact, if Israel gets the sum and the Palestinians get zero, then I think you should think in t terms of zero sum. Now, let me be clear about one point before I press further. Uh, there is a distinction to be made. I'm not just saying it's an easy distinction, but there is a distinction to be made between what's legally a person's right or a people's right and what's politically possible. And uh, the fact that these are Palestinian rights under international law, in my opinion, not in my opinion, is a factual matter, uh, rights that are not disputed by any significant body in the international community, it doesn't mean that in the real world of politics that there has to be some negotiating within the framework of those rights. Uh, so I don't want to be sounding as if I'm being dogmatic uh, on these issues. I recognize there are practical political, uh, uh, practical pol political problems that have to be addressed. Uh, but in fairness, we have to also acknowledge, having said that, that whatever you might think of the Palestinian Authority, and there's nobody whose opinion of it, I suspect, is lower than my own, uh, it must be said that during the negotiations, the Palestinian Authority it did put forth a very uh, talented, uh, some, some very talented, knowledgeable negotiators who presented very reasonable proposals. So in May 2008, uh, there was an exchange of maps between the Palestinian negotiators and the Israeli negotiators. The Palestinians put forth a map. I can't show it to you right now. I didn't bring it along with me. Um, but the Palestinians presented what seemed to me a very reasonable map. The map said, we, will let, we recognize there are 500,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank, illegal under international law, but we recognize it as a practical problem. Uh, and the Palestinians said, okay, let's try to figure out a way to preserve our rights under international law which says the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, the whole of East Jerusalem or occupied Palestinian territory. Let's figure out a way to reconcile what international law says with this practical problem. And they presented a map. And the map showed that they would have with Israel a 2% land swap. The 2% you may sound like, well, what's 2%? What can that solve? See, one of the problems is most people who have, I think, a very, they're not a very, but even practical people, activists, decent people, I think in many ways they have a slightly, let's just say, distorted view of what the picture actually looks like. The built up areas where the settlements are, the built up areas, they constitute only 1.2% of the West Bank. When you see these huge, uh, 
these, these images of huge sprawling settlements taking up the whole of the West Bank, that's not the settlements. That's what's called the settlement blocks. And settlement blocks incorporate a settlement here, a settlement there, connected with a road, and then it becomes a settlement block. And it looks much bigger than the actual settlement. So the big argument between the Israelis and the Palestinians has been over not the issue of annexing the settlements, but annexing the settlement blocks. So the proposal that the Israelis made, excuse me, the proposal that the Palestinians made to the Israelis was, they said, we will allow for a 2% land swap. You can keep 2% of the West Bank, but bear in mind, on that 2%, 60% of the settlers live. So they were allowing for Israel to annex and incorporate fully 60% of the settlers, which is an amazingly generous deal on the part of the Palestinians. And they said, in return, you have to meet three conditions. Number one, the territory you give us from Israel, because it's a 2% land swap, it has to first of all be of equal size. It has to be 2% for 2%. Secondly, they said, it has to be of equal quality. You're getting some of the most arable land in the West Bank. So you're going to have to give us some of the most arable land in Israel. Don't talk about giving us a desert in the Judean, you know, the Judean desert or the Hebron hills. No. It has to be of equal quality. And the third stipulation they made was the fancy word is propinquity or vicinity. If you want a piece of Jerusalem here, right on this side of the Israel-Palestine border, then we have to have a piece of Israel right on the other side. It has to be near each other. Why they, uh, why they stressed so much the propinquity issue, I'll have to tell you I'm not clear in it myself. But what I was clear from reading the record, and I wish some of you would find the time to look at it, because you're really like a fly in the wall. It's the transcripts of the negotiations. The chief Israeli negotiator at the time was Tzipi Livni, who was also the chief negotiator in the current negotiations. At that time, she was the foreign, uh, um, the, the, uh, foreign minister of Israel. It was very interesting to read the exchanges. Because Livni, who's nobody's fool, she's a very bright woman, and they both know the geography like it's the back of their hand. It's a small place, and everybody knows uh, every village and every town. So she would say something, OK, I, I saw your map. What about that settlement? Uh, that settlement is isolated. They said, no, it's no problem, because there's a road over there. She said, what about that settlement? She said, they said, no problem. There can be a bridge built over there. And you could see that the Palestinian negotiator was very sharp, was very sharp, uh, and he clearly wanted to find a reasonable solution. It was not, there was no dogmatism. It was, let's try to solve this problem reasonably. And by the end, you could judge for, him, for yourself reading the transcript, by the end, Livni was flummoxed because she realized, you know what? I think this is actually fair. And her final response was quite revealing. She didn't say it was physically impossible. It wasn't a fact that couldn't be reversed. She said it was politically impossible. She said no Israeli government that accepted this map could survive. It was a political problem. Now, there are a number of aspects of that which are quite illuminating. The one that I would uh, bring to your attention is if you look at the negotiations carefully, the two-state settlement is a physically pos it is a physical possibility. The problem is not, as my co-author Mu'in Rabani put it, the problem is not physics. The problem is politics. 
how to exert enough pressure on the Israeli government such that it finds the will to accept such a settlement. But the claim that the facts on the ground have reached a point such that they can't be reversed and a two-state settlement is impossible is just not true. Uh, it's not true as far as one can tell, as I said, from looking at the maps. There have been some changes. We have to be acknowledged that. In 2008, there were approximately a half million settlers. Now the figure, the last figure I saw uh, was 560,000. So there has been a ten per, approximately a 10% increase. I don't know how significant that is because I'm not sure where the settlers are, if they're in those same areas that the Palestinians were allowing for in the land swap. It doesn't change anything. If it, it's in different areas, yes, it complicates the picture. Um, in any case, uh, I began this short digression by trying to make the point that insisting on Palestinian legal rights under international law, it doesn't mean you're precluding practical proposals for trying to deal with political realities. And in my opinion, the Palestinians have presented very reasonable, reasonable practical proposals on the territorial issue. But as we all know, territorial issue is one issue. The territorial issue actually incorporates three aspects of what are called the permanent status issues. The permanent status issues are usually said to be borders, settlements, Jerusalem. Uh, those are three, and that's all reducible to the territorial aspect of the conflict. Uh, but the fourth one, which is as important, we shouldn't pretend otherwise, and, uh, is the issue of the Palestinian refugees and how do you resolve that. And honestly, we'll say that that's a more difficult one to resolve than the territorial issue. Uh, is it impossible to resolve? No, I'm not, I'm not convinced of that at all. Um, I do believe that with good faith, uh, uh, good faith in, on the Israeli side, uh, ways can be found to resolve uh, that issue. But on the other hand, uh, I will say, trying to resolve the Palestinian legal right, which exists, and in my view, judging by the record, is not open to dispute, namely the Palestinians have the right to return unto international law. Trying to reconcile that with the political solution Yes, it's more difficult. Uh, the Israeli position, however, we could say is a non-starter because everybody seems to agree that at least the first step towards resolving the Palestinian refugee issue has to be twofold recognition by Israel. Number one, a historical recognition of the crime it committed in 1948 when it ethnically cleansed the parts of Palestine that became Israel. And number two, a recognition of the Palestinian right of return under international law. Those are the prerequisites. And then we go into negotiations, and we try to figure out a way practically to solve the problem. Israel's point of departure is it doesn't accept any historical, moral, or legal responsibility for what happened in 1948. Well, that's a non-starter. That's a non-starter. Um, I think once you achieve, once you uh, you enter in good faith and accept your responsibilities both before the bar of history and the legal bar, then there are possibilities uh, to resolve it. In any case, as I said, that's not the carry agenda. The carry agenda is uh, to uh, implement Israel's bottom line, and Israel's bottom line is, as I said, uh, the annexation of 10% uh, of the West Bank and the annulment of the Palestinian uh, right of return. Uh, now the obvious question is, Clinton, a very smart guy, determined guy, uh, he failed. Condoleezza Rice, she made a good faith effort, uh, she failed. So why does John Kerry think he can have enjoy more success when his two predecessors failed. Uh, and that's what I want to look at right now. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Palestinians now face unprecedented isolation. Uh, they're politically very weak uh, regionally. They're politically very weak internationally. 
and they're politically very weak internally. Uh, the Palestine question has always been a kind of enigma, a kind of perplexity, because it has always waxed much larger than its actual geopolitical dimensions. Palestine, Israel, Palestine and Israel are just very, very small places. Uh, and so how did it come to pass that this Palestine issue, which occupies a pinpoint on the world's map, it's managed to galvanize so much international uh, concern and attention. Uh, it happens that the Palestine question has always, for reasons which are not entirely clear, has always commanded a huge amount of public uh, attention. Uh, regionally, in the 1930s, when the Palestinians entered into what was called the Arab Revolt against the British Mandate and then also against um, uh, the Zionist colonization, that Arab revolt in the late 1930s, 1936 to 39, it had a huge resonance throughout the Arab world, and it had significant policy consequences, uh, which I won't have time now to go into. Uh, 1947, when the UN partition plan was uh, passed, calling for the division of Palestine into two states, um, the uh, Palestine question, again, had significant regional uh, ramifications. When Israel declared itself a state in May 1948, as many of you know, neighboring Arab states attacked Israel. Uh, one of the main reasons they attacked, which is often forgotten, is that between December 1947, right after the partition resolution was passed, and May 1948, Israel had already expelled between 250,000 and 300,000 Palestinians from the area that became Israel. And these Palestinians were um, being driven into the neighboring Arab states. It caused a lot of outrage in the neighboring Arab states and caused the heads of state, because the Arab governments didn't want to attack Israel, not that they liked Israel, but none of them except for Jordan had a significant army uh, Jordan had uh, the Arab, just slipped my mind, the Arab Legion. Legion. Uh, Jordan had the Arab Legion, but the other Arab states had virtually nothing. And the very last thing they wanted to do was to squander their armies in the battle with Israel. Uh, but one of the reasons which propelled them to attack was this popular anger at the expulsion of the Palestinians from the state that called itself Israel. After 1948, uh, there was this phenomenon called radical Arab nationalism championed by President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt and Nasser himself as one of the rallying points of his brand of Arab nationalism was to hoist high the cause of Palestine. In actual words, uh, in actual deeds, he actually did very little, but in words it became a critical part of the uh, the Arab, ra radical Arab nationalist ethos, in part because uh, Nasser himself was in one of the armies, the Egyptian army, that suffered defeat in 1948, and he carried that wound uh, around with him and wanted to avenge it, though, as I said, as a practical matter, he actually did very little. Uh, in 1967, the Palestinians suffer, excuse me, the neighboring Arab states suffer another military defeat, and the only thing inspiring coming out of that military defeat was once again the Palestinians. Uh, this time it was the Palestinian Fedayeen movement, and that didn't, or guerrilla movement. That didn't just resonate in the Arab world, that actually had a much broader resonance because it became part of the um, non aligned movement, the third world movement. Uh, the Palestine cause became very large. Exactly why? I think it's an interesting question. I've not read anything that really explains it, but it became a standard bearer of the non-aligned movement of the um, uh, anti-imperialist movement, however you want to term it, uh, the third world movement, and that climaxed as some of the young, older people in the room will remember. That particular phase climaxed in 1974 when Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestine Liberation Organization, he had a hero's welcome at the United Nations uh, and delivered his famous gun or olive branch speech. Uh, and then again in 1987, which brings us closer to the present, uh, more people in the room will remember, 
uh, the Palestinian revolt against the Israeli occupation, which came to be called the Intifada. Uh, the Intifada not only had repercussions in the Arab Muslim world, not only in the third world, but now the Intifada, the Palestinian, this tiny little place, this pinpoint on the world's map, it was actually now having resonances in uh, Euro Western Europe and the United States. Uh, uh, Israel suffered a terrible public relations debacle back then uh, with the Palestinian Intifada. It was overwhelmingly nonviolent for the first two years. Um, and I remember at that point I was teaching uh, and um, a student in the class, the Israel-Palestine conflict came up, and a student, he was neither Muslim nor Jewish, he's what we call in New York, I don't know the term you use here, but we call them white ethnics, which consists mostly of Italians and Irish, uh, this student just raised his hand. He said, stone, Uzi, that's not fair. And that's the way, that was the image that was transmitted. And now the Intifada, the Palestinian cause, was entering the mainstream of uh, uh, Western, Western European and Western life in general. Uh, so throughout the period that I've been surveying for almost you know, a century, uh, the Palestine conflict has always had a, f a fairly large, broad uh, resonance, uh, but now for the first time uh, in uh, the first time in a hundred years, really, the first time in the century, the Palestine struggle no longer inspires or no longer inspires as it once did. Uh, partly it's because Palestinians themselves have stopped resisting, and partly it's because other humanitarian causes Iraq, Libya, Syria. I know we have a representative from Libya, or a couple of people from Libya here, uh, and everybody is familiar with the situations in Syria and Iraq. Uh, as humanitarian crises grow, as, as humanitarian crises uh, are, the crises in Iraq and Syria and Libya just loom much larger. Uh, on a quantitative and a qualitative level. Uh, and so uh, the, Palestine, the, the Palestine struggle has now slipped below uh, the public radar. Uh, I can say, speaking anecdotally, I was in Turkey. I spent a few days in Turkey, and then I spent a few weeks in Iran in the past couple of uh, months. And even though my known area of specialty is Israel and Palestine, I could say without fear of contradiction that not one person in either country, and I was interviewed on significant news programs, not one person had any interest whatsoever in Palestine or Israel. It never came up. Uh, even interesting, uh, for, for those of you who are, who are intrigued by these things, I was at a Muslim conference in, in Turkey. I was the only Jew there. Uh, and only American also present. I was also the only one who had anything to say on Palestine. Uh, not even Israel was a subject of interest, as a matter of fact. The main subject of interest was how to stop Iran. Uh, it was mostly Sunni uh, Muslims, and their preoccupation was Iran. Uh, and in the case of Iran, the main concern was, will President Rouhani succeed in getting the sanctions lifted? Uh, nobody gave a hoot about Palestine. And on a, uh, um, on a popular level, interest has evaporated. And as a consequence, it's also evaporated at the political level, which is to say, if you look at any of the key actors or all of the key actors in the area, uh, you start with Egypt, Egypt complete disaster after the overthrow of the uh, legally elected government of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the new government struck out with a vengeance against the Palestinians, in particular in Gaza, uh, and are now cooperating uh, with the Israelis in trying to strangle Gaza, um, blowing up or, or sealing all of the tunnels, which were the lifeblood of the Gazan economy. So Egypt, a complete disaster. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, which uh, gave some verbal support and also 
monetary support. They're now effectively aligned with Israel. There's a de facto alliance against the claim of an Iranian threat. Uh, Syria is a no factor. Iran uh, won't support the Palestinians for, uh, for various reasons, depending whether they're talking about Hamas or the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and even Turkey, which for a while during the Israeli massacre in Gaza, 2008 and 9, and then during the Israeli killing of the nine civilians on the humanitarian vessel, the Mani, Mahdi Marmara. Uh, at that time, Turkey was making noises in support of the Palestinians, but then the prime minister backed the wrong course in Syria, uh, and now is basically working together with the Israelis to overthrow the government, uh, the current government in Syria. So they've uh, lost all regional support. Uh, I was just reading this morning that even the financial support from Qatar is drying up. Uh, and so the Hamas is in a very desperate situation, and the Palestinian Authority is in no better situation in terms of regional support. Uh, internally, uh, the picture is pretty disastrous. Uh, the West Bank and Gaza, until this morning, and I don't know how things will change, but until this morning, the West Bank and Gaza were not just divided physically, but they were divided psychologically. Gaza became a kind of alien territory to the West Bank, not just, as I said, a physical fact, but as a mental fact. Uh, during the Israeli massacre in 2008-9, um, there were very few demonstrations in the West Bank in support of the people in Gaza. Some people attribute that to the repression of the Palestinian Authority, but I don't think that's true. Palestinians are quite capable of being very brave and defying repression when and if and when they want to, uh, but they did not do so during the uh, Gaza invasion. The people of Gaza uh, are being squeezed on all sides from Egypt, from Israel, from the Palestinian Authority, and the purpose is perfectly obvious. They want the people of Gaza uh, to overthrow Hamas. Um, and they were, until again this morning, and this morning doesn't really change all that much, they were quite successful. The Gaza economy was on the verge of bankruptcy. Hamas was not able to pay any of its employees their paychecks. Uh, and the public opinion polls showed if there would be an election, Hamas would be trounced. Uh, which tells you in large part what Hamas's motive was in this agreement with the Palestinian Authority. It's hoping that it will get out of the agreement at least a mild lifting of the blockade by Egypt. Uh, and also, uh, it's financially wiped out. Um, is, uh, the Palestinian Authority doesn't have all that much to fear because even if there are elections, uh, there's no doubt that Hamas will be uh, overwhelmingly defeated. Uh, in the West Bank and more generally, the Palestinians have given up on politics. Uh, many people don't want to say this publicly, but you can speak to them privately. Uh, for those of you who've been over there, uh, Palestinians have grown despairing, depressed, despondent. Uh, they've grown cynical on politics for good reason and have mostly given up on it. Uh, there are po pockets of resistance, and nobody should in any way gainsay or minimize those pockets of resistance, but they basically remain isolated islands. Uh, the attitude of most Palestinians, perfectly understandable, is every man for himself. Uh, there's a tendency to, quote unquote, idealize oppressed people and forget that for all the heroism that people are capable of displaying in situations like that, they're also ordinary human beings like the rest of us. And if you, when you've suffered 20 or 30 years of defeats, uh, and not only defeats, but setbacks going uh, such that the situation is actually worse than it was before, um, more corruption, uh, uh, more repression, uh, you grow cynical of politics. And it's not surprising that the Palestinians themselves have grown mostly cynical. Uh, we have to be honest about it. There's very little resistance now in Palestine. Uh, there are all sorts of claims being made that they're all, in my opinion, sheer and total nonsense, having nothing to do with the real world. 
The Palestinian Authority, it's hopelessly corrupt, incompetent. It survives mostly because of apathy by most Palestinians. Uh, about 25% of Palestinians are dependent on paychecks from the Palestinian Authority, so they support it because it's a patronage system. Uh, there is a fear among Palestinians that if the Palestinian Authority dissolves, uh, you're going to have another Libya or Syria or Iraq on their hands, which they don't want. So there's a certain element that would support the, the preservation of the Palestinian Authority uh, if the only uh, alternative is going to be anarchy and chaos. And finally, the uh, Americans and the Jordanians have succeeded in putting into place a very sophisticated apparatus of repression and torture. Uh, they are quite uh, good now. It's not the Palestinian security agencies are no longer a rinky-dink operation. They're quite sophisticated, quite effective at doing what they are supposed to do. They were trained by the Americans, um, excellent torturers, which is, you know, th that's how you bring democracy to the Arab world. Uh, and the Palestinian Authority is completely in thrall uh, to the e EU and the U.S., there's all this silliness. I mean, there are sometimes as aspects of the Israel-Palestine conflict which really have to make you laugh. Uh, every three months or so, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they put out these hefty reports on the Palestinian economy. They are very, very sophisticated with all these graphs and all of these coefficients and I don't know what the hell they're talking about most of the time. I read it, my mind, gla gla you know, my eyes glaze over it. Um, and they're talking about this sector and that sector and what they need to do here and what they need to do there. And then they talk about how the Palestinian economy is doing in comparison with other developing economies. How is the Palestinian economy doing in relationship to the Brazilian economy and the Taiwanese economy? There's only one problem with all these speculations. There is no Palestinian economy. It just doesn't exist. A moment's reflection will tell you the very idea is preposterous. Of the West Bank, Israel controls the land of about 40% of the West Bank, what's called Area C. So now you subtract 40% where there's no Palestinian economy, there's nothing. It's Israel that controls the whole thing. So now you're left with 60% of the West Bank. In that 60% of the West Bank, Israel controls all the critical resources, for example, the water. Israel controls all the imports. Israel controls all the exports. The whole place is fragmented in a rat's maze of uh, roadblocks and other impediments. Israel controls the customs duties. So for example, this month, they collected $100 million, which they were supposed to hand over to the Palestinian Authority, because that's their money. It's Palestinian money. Israel controls it because it collects the money at the borders. And it announced today, we're not giving you the money. That was the cabinet decision this morning by Israel. It controls the taxes. It controls the critical resources. It controls what goes in. It controls what goes out. How could there be a Palestinian economy? And sometimes there are these moments where the Israelis are pretty honest about it. So a couple of, uh, about three days ago when the Palestinian Authority was declaring that we're going to dissolve the Palestinian Authority, which of course was nonsense, they were never going to do it. But they were saying they were going to do it. And um, some Israelis uh, columnists, in particular one of their senior officials, his name is, uh, senior commentators, his name is Nahum Barnia, and he writes an article, and he says, well, if they dissolve it, we have a problem on our hands. He said, because there are 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank, and he said, and there's no economy there. You know, no IMF nonsense, no World Bank nonsense. It was straightforward. There's no economy there. So how does it survive? It survives, as everybody knows. It survives because of U.S. and EU subsidies, the foreign handouts from the U.S. and the EU. That's the whole economy in the uh, West Bank. And that's how it survives. And that's the leverage. The leverage that Kerry hopes to use is 
and also the EU, the leverage is to get the Palestinians to sign on to the Israeli bottom line, to get them to sign on by threatening to withhold the money. And in fact, just as Abbas, uh, Prime Minister Abbas for the 10th, no, excuse me, President Abbas for the 10,000th time threatened to dissolve the Palestinian Authority, he got a phone call from President Obama and Obama said to him, there are going to be financial repercussions. And then Abbas said, we're not dissolving the Palestinian Authority uh, for very practical reasons. Um, and it's the same thing with the EU. The EU position has been a bit of an oddity. On paper, on paper, the position of the European Union has not been bad. If you look in the, in the United Nations voting record, their statements on resolving the conflict have been perfectly consistent with international law. And I would say on paper, their position has been completely honorable. The problem is it's never been translated into anything practical because they're terrified of uh, alienating, riling the United States. Israel, Palestine is American turf. So we're not gonna do anything to uh, upset the Americans. On the other hand, the EU has grown wary, the European countries have grown wary of this conflict. It's just from a European point of view, it's just absurdly interminable. It just goes on and on and on and on. And the whole place is like this side of the room is about the size of Israel and this side of the room is about the size of Palestine. It doesn't make any sense. And so these Europeans have gotten wary of it, uh, and they have decided, as foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton has said, uh, the Kerry plan is the only, it's the only show, let's get these, the only game in town, she said. And now the EU has gotten on board to support Kerry. As they said today, it was an interesting statement, by the way, the EU hailed the agreement between Hamas and uh, the Palestinian Authority, they issued a strong statement supporting it. Uh, but they said it's a step towards implementing the carry peace proposal. And the EU is weary both of the conflict, but more importantly, they're weary of paying all the bills. Because if you go into the West Bank, all the projects, all the NGOs, they're financed by the EU, by European countries. And they've grown weary of shelling out all of this money. And so now the EU is using a carrot and its stick. The, uh, the stick is they're telling the Palestinian Authority, if you don't join on the carry plan, we're pulling out, we're pulling the plugs. And they're also telling the Israelis, they're telling the Israelis that if you don't uh, get on the carry bandwagon, uh, we're going to escalate our sanctions on the settlements in the West Bank. Uh, that's the stick, and the carrot is uh, they're saying to both sides, there'll be real material rewards if you resolve the conflict. They're saying to the Palestinians that we'll pour in a lot of money, and they're saying to the Israelis, we'll upgrade your status in the EU if you go along with the carry plan. Uh, the uh, EU is Israel's main trading partner, so it's a significant, it would be a significant increase, uh, a, a, a significant reward for the Israelis if they succeeded uh, in, if they resolved the conflict, there would be a significant reward for the um, Israelis. And that leaves the last question which I want to look at before I end my remarks. I have the time? Yeah, okay, the last question is one which must be puzzling a lot of people in the room. The question is, if what I'm saying is true, that the Kerry mission is basically to implement Israel's core demands, then why is Israel rejecting it? Why is Israel playing a recalcitrant role? That doesn't seem to make much sense. So let me just, in the time that allows me, <coughs> Uh, to briefly explain, in my opinion, what's going on. First of all, you might recall I began by saying that the U.S. has no big interest in resolving the conflict. Uh, Israel and Palestine is not on the international agenda. The Obama administration has many other things to worry about. 
uh, there's no pressing urgency to the resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict for the US administration. The same thing is true for Israel. Israel right now is feeling no pressure at all on the Israel-Palestine front. It's been removed from the international agenda. That's number one. And number two, for those of you who've traveled to Israel, you can attest, I think, to the fact that it barely impinges any longer on Israeli life. It has no real repercussions any longer. The uh, Israel-Palestine, the Israeli occupation on, is, uh, on Israeli life. The dirty work is being done by the Palestinians, the policing work, uh, and the uh, uh, the so-called terrorist attacks, uh, they're just no longer a factor uh, in Israeli life. Uh, so there's no real pressing concern, no urgency on the part of the Israelis to negotiate a settlement. If you look at the history of the conflict, Israel has signed several agreements in the past, but they've only signed agreements with their Arab neighbors when there was a pressing need to do so. So, for example, Israel suffered a major military setback in 1973, what's sometimes called the Yom Kippur War. Uh, there were about two to 3,000 Israeli soldiers who were killed. And at least at the beginning, it seemed like a close call for the Israelis. Uh, and the feeling was on the Israeli part that we better resolve this conflict with Egypt because, you know, we may not do all that great if and when there's a second round. Uh, the line that in my opinion, captures the whole Israeli thinking behind the decision to negotiate a settlement with Egypt. It was caught best by the foreign minister back then, Moshe Dayan. Uh, he wrote a book on the so-called peace process. I think it was called Destination Peace. Don't quote me on that. I think it was called Destination Peace. And he had to explain why did Israel sign this agreement. And he said the, the reason is very simple, he said. A car has four wheels. If you remove one wheel of the, from the car, it's stuck in the ground. It can't move. The Arab front had four wheels. It was Egypt, Syria, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Jordan. I forgot the fourth one he included, but let's just say three for the moment. He said, if we re remove the Egyptian wheel from the Arab front, they can't fight a war against us anymore. And so, after the lesson of 1973, they decide to remove the Egyptian wheel. They sign an agreement. The second major agreement the Israelis signed was in 1993, the agreement with the Palestinians. And there, they also had very significant reasons for doing so. Uh, the significant reasons were, number one, as I said, this occupation after the first intifada became a huge public relations debacle for Israel. It was the first time for younger for people here who go back, uh, the first main disaster, public relations disaster for Israel was the 1982 Lebanon war. Uh, but the 1987 Palestinian Intifada, it really reached into the mainstream of American life and it caused huge problems for Israel. And then the pr uh, prime minister at the time, Yitzhak Rabin, he was very honest. If people go back and look at the record, he said what we have to do is we have to get Palestinians to do the dirty work so we won't have problems with all these liberal human rights organizations like ACRI, the uh, uh, civil rights in Israel. The, what does ACRI stand for? ACR for civil rights in Israel, Association for Civil Rights in Israel. ACRI, Bet Selam. He says we'll get all these liberal organizations off our back because they accuse us, rightfully of course, of committing masses, massive amounts of indiscriminate torture. So we'll get the Palestinians to do all the torture, and we will have a, we'll be out of the picture. So the first thing was that Israel wanted to clean up its public relations act, let Palestinians torture Palestinians, and then we won't have a problem. And by the way, I don't have time to go into it, but the problem of torture was a very big one for Israel. Um, and it came out in the first intifada. Israel had been torturing Palestinian detainees since 1967, and it's freely acknowledged now uh, if you read, for example, Benny Morris's Righteous Victims or, uh, or uh, Tom Segev's 1967, they just say in passing without any big to-do about it, the Israelis were torturing Palestinian detainees since 1967. What changed was in 1987 with the first intifada, it became massive because they had a huge civil, civil revolt on their hands. 
and the torture of Palestinians to use the human rights organization uh, language. It was methodical, systematic, and routine. Israel was uh, methodically, routinely, and systematically torturing Palestinian uh, uh, civilians, detainees. The number was huge. Uh, human Rights Watch estimated between 20 and 30,000 Palestinian detainees had been tortured between 1987 and I think 19, maybe 1993, but maybe less, maybe 1990. Uh, and the other important fact was it was now Israeli human rights organizations which, was docu which were documenting it. So Israel had a very hard time denying it. The first major report came out, not from Amnesty International, not from Human Rights Watch. It came out in 1990 uh, from Beth Selim. And so Israel really had an impossible time trying to deny it. You know, some creeps like Alan Dershowitz attempted to, but it really wasn't very successful uh, when it was perfectly obvious uh, what was going on and it was undeniable. So that was the first major reason Israel signed that 1993 agreement with the Palestinians. And the second major reason was there were just, it was a civil, civil revolt and Israel has a civilian army and Israel is a small place which meant if you went into the occupied territories then, anybody there who was there during the first intifada? I'm just curious. I spent a lot of time there during those years. Um, if you went there, you saw 65-year-old Israelis in fatigues. They had to bring up their whole reserve army. There were 500,000 Israelis at one time in the occupied territories at that moment. Yeah, it was a huge civilian revolt. And the Israelis began to worry. If our soldiers are busy chasing little kids down alleyways who are throwing stones, then they won't have time to train for war. And that's what the army is supposed to do. It's supposed to be training people to fight real wars, not what was called policing actions. And so the second reason they signed the uh, um, Oslo Agreement was to get the army out of that situation so it can do what it's supposed to do, you know, fight real wars. Uh, kill uh, Syrians and Egyptians and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so in those two cases, Israel had real motives. Right now, as I said, there's no urgency on the part of Israel to resolve the conflict. It's more or less a weighing the pros and the cons. And there are some significant pros for <coughs> Israel. As I said, if it ends the conflict now, if Netanyahu signs, first of all, he gets 10% of the West Bank. He gets annulment of the right of return. He gets an upgrading of status uh, in the EU. Uh, he will get probably better relations with the United States. There are incentives, but the incentives aren't yet. They aren't seen as uh, significant enough that Netanyahu is ready to uh, sign an agreement. Uh, and let me just end with the last, the, the, what the, the Israeli position is right now. Uh, the Israeli position, as everyone I suppose in this room knows, is they've incorporated um, two new demands. There were the core demands, which I mentioned. Uh, up until now, that was the Israeli position. And now they have incorporated two new demands. The two new demands are they say they want to keep uh, parts of the Jordan Valley, and they want uh, Israel to be recognized as a Jewish state. Uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, retention of Jordan Valley uh, shouldn't detain us because it's actually just a meaningless demand. Uh, Israelis have freely, Israelis and their supporters have freely acknowledged that the Jordan Valley has exactly zero strategic value uh, to Israel. Uh, Shlomo Ben Ami, Israel's former foreign minister, if you open up his book, Scars of War, Wounds of Peace, he, quote, he refers to the mythical, that's his words, the mythical strategic value of the Jordan Valley. Even Dennis Ross, who's just a hack, uh, if you look at his book, The Missing Peace, even he says there doesn't really seem to be much of an argument that the Jordan Valley has any strategic value. And, these, and also senior Israeli officials uh, have said the same thing. Exactly why Israel wants to keep the Jordan Valley uh, or Netanyahu says he wants to keep the Jordan Valley. Uh, that's a matter of speculation. I can give you my own opinion, but we'll leave that for later. Uh, the last issue is the question of recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. 
And the recognition of Israel as a Jewish state just as a matter of history and reason. It just doesn't make any sense. It can't be a real issue. Israel signed peace agreements, as I said, with Egypt in 19, the Camp David Accord in 1978, the Israel-Egypt uh, Agreement of 1979. Um, the uh, Egyptians weren't asked as part of the agreement to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. It never even came up in the negotiations. Uh, if you look at the record of the negotiations, the prime minister at the time was Menachem Begin. He argued very hard, uh, very forcefully to keep the oil wells in the uh, Egyptian Sinai, to keep the settlements in the Egyptian Sinai, to keep the airfields in the Egyptian Sinai, but recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now remember, at that time, Menachem Begin was considered the far right. He never raised the issue. He's the same party as Netanyahu, the Likud. It never came up. The next agreement, 1993, the Oslo Agreement, what's called Oslo I of 1991. Okay, you could say it's a very broad agreement. It, has, it runs to maybe two pages, and so maybe they forgot about it then. Okay, the argument is not really tenable, but for argument's sake, let's accept it. Oslo II, the agreement that was signed in September 1995, Oslo II is 314 folio-sized pages. It goes through every aspect, every facet of the Israeli occupation, every period, every comma, every semicolon, every colon has been vetted by those Israeli lawyers. Everything. They have four pages just on the question of Palestinian VIPs, VIPs 1, VIPs 2, VIPs 3, and then there's a fourth category. It looks at everything. Recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, it never came up. It was never an issue. 1994, Israel enters into a peace treaty with Jordan. Recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, it never comes up. 2006, President Bush, who can hardly be accused of being anti-Israel, Bush uh, releases the roadmap to peace. There's no, 2006, there's no mention of recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. It was a roadmap which says, Israel has to do this, simultaneously Palestinians have to do that. Israelis have to do this, simultaneously Palestinians have to do that. It goes step by step by step by step by step by step. Nothing about recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. It never comes up. That's the historical record. Now, what does reason tell you? How can, how can Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state if no two Israelis agree on who is a Jew? let alone what is a Jewish state. How can you recognize Israel as a Jewish state if nobody knows what it means to call Israel a Jewish state? When Israel's chief justice, Aharon Barak, was asked the question, they put to him a question squarely. They said, you, in your uh, founding documents, your Declaration of Independence, you call Israel a Jewish state and you call Israel a democratic state. How do you reconcile those two principles? And he was very honest, and he said, we haven't figured that out. So if they don't know what it is to call Israel a Jewish state, how can you expect Palestinians to recognize something, the content of which nobody, by admission, understands what it means? But there's another question. The question is, if, if Israel were serious about wanting to be recognized as a Jewish state, there's a very easy way to do it. And it's not facetious what I'm suggesting. In 1979, after the revolution in Iran, the new government in Iran wanted Iran to be recognized in this, as an Islamic state. So what was the first thing they did? Within four months of the revolution, they changed their name to the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
And so now anyone who recognized Iran was ipso facto recognizing the Islamic Republic of Iran, because that's their name. All Israel has to do, if it wants to be recognized as a Jewish state, it's very simple. All they have to do is change their name to the Jewish state of Israel. It's not complicated. It's not unprecedented. They simply have to do what the mullahs did, uh, change their name to the Jewish state of Israel. Now, it's an interesting question. I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, why the hell don't they do that? And the answer is actually quite revealing. Because in significant ways, Israel is a democratic society. And it knows full well that if it changed its name to the Jewish state of Israel, the 20% of Israelis who are not Jewish would be outraged and would express their outrage at its redesignation. And so now you have the paradox that Israel wants Palestinians to do what Israel itself won't do. They want Palestinians to recognize themselves as a Jewish state, but they themselves won't recognize themselves as a Jewish state. Uh, so where does that leave us? Uh, in my opinion, and that's where I'm going to end off, in my opinion, the reason Israel, uh, Netanyahu, is making this demand is not because he takes it seriously. Uh, he figures that... Uh, in order to get the Kerry plan approved by his coalition, and his coalition consists largely of crazies, lunatic people, but that's his coalition, and that's where he feels most comfortable. That's home for, uh, uh, a, uh, for Netanyahu. He figures if he can extract that concession from the Palestinians, recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, it would be a huge ideological victory for the components of his coalition. Because for that coalition, what constitutes a victory, an ideological victory, is how much you can humiliate the Palestinians. That's for them. Uh, victory is humiliating Palestinians. If they can extract that concession from the, uh, from the Palestinians, recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, it will be a huge humiliation, which in his mind, he figures if he can extract that concession, then he probably can get them to go along with the rest of the Kerry plan. So I don't agree with the people who say that he's just trying to sabotage the negotiations by bringing in that demand. I think he's using that demand uh, because from a political point of view, if he can achieve it, it would be uh, a, a way to um, uh, br uh, get support from his coalition uh, for the uh, Kerry plan. Uh, so that's the picture as I see it. Uh, and now I'll be very happy to hear your questions, comments, uh, not just bearing on the topic of my talk this evening, but on any other concerns you might have. Uh, thank you. Um, if you can ask a question, please use the microphone because this is being recorded and the standard rules apply, you know, a question, maybe a, you know, a brief comment, but not a speech. The floor is open. Uh, the easiest thing is just to line up because for the sake of the video, they need you to speak there. Norman, I've just finished reading Blumenthal's book, Goliath, mm -hmm. and it uh, it paints a picture of internal rot that is uh, serious and ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I was most struck by the fact that uh, uh, there's a vigorous Israeli community growing apace uh, of disaffected Israelis who now live in Berlin. Would you like to comment on that turn of events? Um, let me just speak broadly on the issue. I can't speak with any kind of authority uh, on the emigration. Uh, I think the figures I had read, now I could be wrong in that there are 200,000 Israelis now in Germany. Uh, it may be as high as that. Uh, that's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting issue, obviously, that uh, Germany has now become a haven for sane Israelis. Uh, but I'm going to leave aside that. There's, there's no question in my mind that uh, Israel has a, trend, uh, large aspect, a large uh, 
components of this real society, yeah, have gone crazy. It's uh, become, as I've said, and I probably have been quoted too much on that particular statement, it's become a lunatic state. Uh, I'm a little bit, however, I'm a little bit, um, let's say, I don't want to say I'm skeptical. I have a problem with depicting Israel as having reached a point where sort of there's no alternative but to get rid of it. Uh, I don't really uh, belong to that school of thought. So let me just start, backtrack a little. Number one, it's often said that Israel was born in original sin, which is true. It was born in the expulsion of the indigenous population. And to deny that, I think, is just to deny fairly uncontroversial facts. There were people there, and the people were kicked out of their homes. Uh, but does that mean that Israel can't change? Uh, everybody in this room knows the United States was born in twice the original sin, because our, well, our original sin was actually triple, because it consisted of extermination, ex extermination expulsion, and enslavement. Uh, enslavement of the African population and the extermination and expulsion of the native population. And it was an, it was an original sin. Uh, we've had to live with it, and we should have to live with it, of course, uh, up until the present. Uh, but does that mean that the United States is unreformable, unchangeable? Uh, does it, do the people who came here and committed those sins and their descendants, do they have to pack up and leave? Uh, no, I'm not really of that school of thought. Uh, there, I don't think there's any state in the world that wasn't born in original sin. So I, I, I don't think that using that standard to delegitimize Israel is a, is a fair standard. You should recognize the sin for sure, just as we as Americans should recognize the sins that accompanied, attended the creation of the United States. Uh, but it doesn't follow from that that a country can't reform, is incapable of reform. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully, I think, changing for the better. Uh, in the case of South African society during the 1980s, that society was completely crazy. I mean, it was, uh, the far right there was not unlike the far right now in Israel. And they were as dug in as the Israelis are now. And they had the same attitude of the whole world is against us. And they had the same way they dealt with the problem they would say, why is everybody focusing on South Africa? It's so much worse than other African countries. There's less democracy. People are poor, poorer in the other African countries. And what about Eastern Europe? And what about communism? And blah, 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 blah. They used the same sorts of arguments. And they had the same levels of fanaticism as the Israelis. Uh, but that, to me, again, doesn't mean that South Africa wasn't. It's still in a very primitive stage, but wasn't able to uh, reform. Uh, and so I have a little problem with these kinds of depictions of Israel such that, yes, it's filled with all sorts of craziness, all sorts of fanaticism. It was born in original sin. All those statements are true. But it doesn't follow, in my opinion, from those facts that therefore Israel becomes a quote-unquote illegitimate state, illegal state. Israel has to be dismantled. Israel has to disappear and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't see the logic of it. I don't accept it. Uh, I don't see any basis for it. Uh, and so, frankly, I reject it. Uh, I can accept the, the bill of it. I can accept the indictment. Well, I'll accept the indictment on two, uh, with two caveats. Number one, uh, don't forget about your own country and its record before you go indicting Israel. Uh, and number two, I don't accept the political conclusion that follows from the indictment. Countries can be guilty of the worst sorts of sins, the worst sorts of crimes, and they can change. Just to give you one example, which always which strikes me very much, uh, I'm not going to make any apologies for other imperialist countries because the record of Western imperialism uh, in the 19th and 20th century is horrible. That's just a fact. But I think it's fair to say, and I don't say with any kind of disparagement towards anyone, that the most racist and militarist countries of the first part of the 20th century, the most racist and the most militarist, were Germany and Japan. Uh, the records were terrible. I mean, it's often forgotten. The Japanese killed about 26 million Chinese during World War II. It was a ghastly state. Um, but here's the irony. 
Some of you might look occasionally at the, the BBC World Service polls. Every year, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, it does a survey. It asks, country, it asks people from 36 countries around the world, it asks, which country do you think has had the most positive impact on the world? Which countries do you think have had the most negative impact on the world? The negative every year, it's the same. Four countries at the bottom, it's always Iran, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. Every single year, they're always at the bottom. You know what the two countries at the top every year are? It's a very interesting fact. The most positive impact on the world is Germany and Japan. Well, countries can change. And we should, I think, be uh, sensitive to that fact. As I said, I am the last person on God's earth to in any way want to diminish the magnitude of the indictment against Israel, since I spent a good part of my adult life documenting it and reading through tens of thousands of pages of human rights reports to get every period and comma right. Uh, and, and frankly, it's the thing that kept me going for most of my adult life. Whenever I thought, all right, I'm tired of this. I really, I can't take it anymore. This is just not the way I expected to spend my life. Uh, I would read another human rights report on what's going on there, and it just, you know, just ripped me up inside. This was just wrong. And it was wrong in the most brutal sorts of ways. It was just a person builds a house for his family. The Israelis demolish it. He builds it again. They demolish it. He builds it a third time. They demolish it. He builds it a fourth time. They demolish it. This is just. No, this is just crazy. So I'm not going to in any way diminish what Israel has done, but I think there's a, a certain segment, let's call it that, a certain segment of the solidarity movement that draws conclusions from these facts, which I find unacceptable, uh, both because I think they're hypocritical and also because I don't think the conclusions follow from the facts. Um, you can say the worst things about Israel, but it doesn't follow from that fact that Israel has to disappear. Well, uh, putting aside the potential indictment of the BDS people and so forth, mm -hmm. where do you see the role of activists and, and so forth that may not necessarily <coughs> want to focus on indictment? Mm -hmm. No, it's a good question. I want to talk about that. Um, first of all, one has to be realistic, I think, about what activists can do. A solidarity movement is just that. It's solidarity with a movement. It's not in place of the movement. In the case of South Africa, if you look at the record, we, I only mention South Africa because that's what BDS always invokes. It invokes the... The, the record of South Africa. I've gone through the literature very carefully on the record of the what was called back then the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign. Uh, the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign, you can say two salient facts about it. Fact number one about the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign, fact number one is it always um, uh, it developed in tandem with the internal struggle in South Africa. So when does the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign begin? It begins right after 1960 uh, with the, um, the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa. That's when the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign begins. It begins in the UK. It spreads, begins in the UK and the US, really. Uh, and it has very small beginnings. What's the next high point of the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign? It comes in 1976 with the Soweto Massacre, uh, when several hundred uh, uh, African, uh, South African blacks were mowed down by the uh, South African apartheid regime. That's its next high point. Uh, the third high point, which most people here will remember, because that's when it really began to reach the mainstream, uh, was 1984-85, when there was mass civil unrest in South Africa, and it climaxed with the state of emergency 
that the South African apartheid regime imposed. And that's when the sanctions began really to bite. Uh, the most significant step at that point was in the United States with the passage of the, um, it just, uh, the CAAA, the, the uh, Anti-Apartheid Act, the Congre uh, something, a C A A A, but I forgot what the C stood for. Uh, in Congress, uh, it passed, uh, despite the uh, Reagan uh, veto of it, uh, it passed in 1986. So the first significant fact about the anti-apartheid sanctions campaign is it always grew in tandem with what was, what was happening in South Africa. It wasn't an independent factor. It was a dependent factor. The second fact about it is its impact was very limited. The high point was the passage of the CAAA in our Congress, and even that was a very porous bill that allowed for all sorts of uh, loopholes which the Reagan administration took advantage of. The victory in South Africa came first and foremost from the internal mass mobilization of South Africa. So take these two facts and now look at the BDS. First of all, BDS is making all these sorts of claims about a qualitative leap, a turning point, a breakthrough, this, that, and the other. Every time you read, it's a new turning point, a new breakthrough, a new qualitative leap. How can that be? There is no resistance right now in the occupied Palestinian territories. How can these victories, these claims, be true? They're just not credible, the sorts of claims that are being made about the power of the BDS. The BDS cannot liberate Palestine. The only ones who can liberate Palestine are the Palestinians themselves. We can play a solidarity role for sure. We can play a supportive role for sure. And my entire adult life, I've tried to play a supportive role. But this notion that we can replace a movement among the Palestinians themselves has no connection with reality. I don't know where people are coming up with these ideas. The BDS is going to liberate Palestine? The whole movement to me doesn't make any sense on a moment's reflection. BDS says we are the largest civil society coalition in Palestine. They say that over and over again. They say we represent 170 organizations. I don't know what the figure is now. That was the last one I read. So I think to myself, if you're really a civil society coalition representing Palestinians, then why are you organizing BDS? Why aren't you organizing among yourselves internal resistance? Like every other movement in history, every other emancipatory movement in history. That doesn't make sense to me. I can't understand the things that are being said. There are people here who were involved in the civil rights movement. Imagine if, as many of you know, older people and younger people. So during the civil rights movement, young African Americans, they would sit in places like Woolworths in the South at the lunch counters demanding the right to be served because those were segregated lunch counters. And then they were being beaten mercilessly. And so what happens? Solidarity movements develop in the North where people in the North begin to picket Woolworths and saying that your branches in the South are committing all these heinous crimes, so on and so forth. Now you ask yourself a simple question. Could the movement in the North in solidarity with African Americans in the South, could it have succeeded if African Americans in the South weren't in the first place sitting in at the lunch counters. We would have looked ridiculous. Most people would have said, the broad public would have said with a certain amount of reasonableness, why are you protesting here 
they're not doing anything there. There's no way a boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement here can reach a broad public and reach critical mass unless there is movement there. It doesn't make any sense, the claims that are being made. There are these grandiose, in my opinion, wildly inflated claims that have no correspondence with reality. And then the second question is, if a mass movement develops there, can the BDS program develop, uh, can the BDS program uh, win a broad public in the, in the United States? And there I think it's not possible. And I want to simply explain why. And uh, listen, there are probably people here who support BDS, and you can freely disagree with me. I'm, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I try to use common sense and also study the record. Every publication of BDS begins with the following words. The BDS program is anchored in international law, and it's based on Palestinian rights that are protected, defended, inscribed in international law. That's what they always say. And they say we have three rights under international law. Well, we have one broad right, the right to self-determination. And this right of self-determination takes three concrete forms. Number one, Israel has to withdraw from the occupied Palestinian territories, the West Bank and Gaza. Number two, the right of return has to be implemented for the Palestinian refugees. And number three, um, Palestinians have to have full equality in Israel. And that all sounds perfectly legitimate, and one can't argue with that. That's the law. It's true. But the law doesn't end there. The law also says the same law, the same law, one and the same body of law, says that just as Israel, excuse me, just as Palestinians have a right to self-determination and statehood, that same body of law says Israel has the right to self-determination and statehood. It's the same law. So if you look at the 2004 ICJ opinion, uh, International Court of Justice opinion, and the BDS call, its first document comes out in July 2005 to mark the anniversary of the International Court of Justice opinion. If you look at the very last sentence of the ICJ opinion, it says, we look forward to the creation of two states in uh, two states, Israel and Palestine, living next to each other in peace. So you ask BDS, where do you stand on Israel? They say, we take no position. Well, how could you take no position? You say you're anchored in the law. And the law says Israel is a state. Just like Palestinians have the right to self-determination and statehood, so does Israel. So how can you take no position? You can't just pick and choose, cherry pick international law and say, I'll take the aspects of international law which serve my purpose. That's not the law. If we have an obligation, if we have the right to walk at the green, it's because we have an obligation to stop at the red. Every right in law comes with an obligation. Every right comes with a responsibility. You can't say, I have a right to walk at the green, but I take no position on the red. That doesn't make any sense. So how can you claim you have the right to self-determination and statehood under international law, and then claim you take no position on Israel? What sense does that make? How do you expect to convince a broad public? The broad public is not a cult. They hear all sides. That's what a democratic society is about. So you go before a broad public and you say to a broad public exactly what BDS says. We support international law. Under international law, we have this right, we have that right, we have that right. That's the law. Fine. Joe Public agrees with you. Joe Q. Public says, that sounds reasonable, that sounds fair, that sounds just. But Joe Q. Public doesn't just talk to BDS and its supporters. It also hears the other side. So it goes, talks to Israelis and their supporters, of which there are an ample number. And they're very efficient, and they know the media very well. And the other side says, don't believe a word those people say. They say that they care about Palestinian rights, 
But that's not true. They have a hidden agenda. Their real agenda is they want to destroy Israel. That's what the other side says. OK, so Joe Q. Public, now here's the other side. And then here she goes back to the BDS people and says, well, you know, you convinced me. But then I heard what the Israeli side said. And the Israeli side said, you really want to destroy Israel. So what is your position on Israel? BDS says we take no position. Well, I'm glad I heard someone laugh. Is that going to convince? Is that going to win over a public? We take no position? I don't think so. And I don't think it should. Because the fact of the matter is, if we're honest about these things, no position can cover many things. Yes, it can, it can cover a democratic secular state with equal rights for everyone. But no position can also cover, it's a possibility within the range. It can also cover wiping Israel out, killing all Jews. I don't know. If you say you take no position, it means there are many possibilities there. So how do you convince the public with that? Leave aside the morality. How do you convince the public of that? That's just pure hypocrisy, and you're not going to convince anyone. So I don't, I don't understand. I, uh, the thing that's most troubling about this whole phenomenon is the objections I raise are just so perfectly obvious, and I've used every occasion I could to voice them. I've never heard anyone attempt to answer them. It's like, you don't exist. BDS doesn't answer opponents. BDS just hurls epithets. The moment you raise an objection, you become a liberal Zionist. You become a racist, a colonialist, racist, Zionist, imperialist. I use the acronym CRAZY. Colonialist, racist, Zionist, imperialist. That's how I remember it. Uh, because my webmaster, who I love to, uh, I love dearly, Sana Kasim, uh, whenever she hears some of my criticisms, she says, I think you forget that Israel is a colonialist, racist, Zionist, imperialist. And say, I said, Sana, I have an acronym now just to make it very easy for all of us. Just say crazy, right? crazy state, and we'll uh, leave it at that. Um, nobody answers it. You just uh, put in a, uh, you know, in a uh, category. And, uh, you know, I remember that. I'm not hard on that BDS people. I'm not hard on them because I was the same way at that age. Uh, I was a Maoist. And everybody who disagreed, you were a petty bourgeois or a bourgeois. I remember my, a good friend of mine, his father, I used to call him a petty bourgeois whenever he disagreed with anything I said about politics. <laughs> And he said, Norman, why do, you, why do I have to be petty? Can't I be like a full bourgeois? What do I have to be a petty bourgeois? <laughs> so I sort of get it. I can understand it. But you know, to put matters simply, I just uh, passed through my 60th birthday. And I'm really too old for that. I'm too old for cults. I'm too old for gurus. I'm too old for slogans. I'm too old for mantras. You really have to convince me in order to get my support. You can't play these games of pressing the buttons of, uh, you know, some people know how to manipulate white liberals and know how to press those buttons uh, to make them, as we used to call it in the 1960s, to guilt trip white liberals. And I'm not a liberal, I'm a radical, but uh, a lot of liberals and radicals were very easily manipulated uh, uh, and uh, ended up doing very dumb things, really stupid things, uh, because the wrong, the, some others, the vanguard of the oppressed, as it was called back then, uh, because the vanguard of the oppressed knew how to press the buttons. Uh, and my buttons can't be pressed. It's over. Uh, and so I just want rational responses. And if I don't get it, I'm not going to accept it. And I don't care who claims to be the vanguard of whatever doesn't make the slightest difference to me. Uh, you have to explain to me these things. How can you say you support international law and claim to be agnostic on Israel? That doesn't make any sense. If you want to say, the hell with the law, the law serves colonial racist, Zion, uh, Zionist imperial, fine, that's a reasonable position. But what you can't do is say you support the law 
but then become agnostic in Israel. That's just not possible. It's not tenable. You can't juggle those two balls in the same hand. Uh, now, I know you want to turn, pull the plug on me, uh, but I plan to go through tomorrow morning because my flight leaves at 6.30. Now, uh, uh, you disagree with me? Good. I, I, I'd like you to disagree. You give me a chance. Go ahead. The point is my question was not on BDS. Uh -huh. The question is, you know, most of these people are, 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 are probably, um, they, they affirm uh, international uh, agreements, they recognize Israel, they are pushing for uh, hopefully a resolution of the conflict based on the 67 border. That means that they, they accept Israel. Um, my question is, how do you not deflate the aspirations and the work for that that most of us have been doing for you know ages and are unlikely to to uh, decrease the the interest in Israel Palestine the future. You know, where 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 should our efforts uh, be concentrated? What is the strategy for activism that has nothing to do with not recognizing Israel? We are recognizing Israel. Okay, I, I actually I totally if you ask me as a practical matter. As a practical matter, I think a lot of the BDS accomplishments have been very impressive. I do. I'm not afraid to say that. I said in the last thing I wrote, as a practical matter, the BDS activists on the college campuses who have gotten the resolutions passed calling for divestment from uh, companies which are either uh, involved in human rights violations or in, ac in activities in the occupied territories, totally support that. I think it's terrific. I think some of their accomplishments and achievements I would not have predicted. They are showing incredible commitment, conviction, conscientiousness. It's a very impressive show. I'm just saying two things. Number one, Let's not get carried away about realistic possibilities. BDS will not liberate Palestine. It can help. And number two, that so long as you subscribe to the BDS three-point program and make no mention of Israel, it becomes an albatross because immediately you get tagged with wanting to destroy Israel. And so if you look at the various... Um, various resolutions, and I've looked at it carefully. You take the case of the one in 2013 in uh, Berkeley. It was very interesting, and some of you, if you have the time, go on the web and read the transcripts. It was a very moving debate. Several hundred people showed up. I know Alice Walker showed up. Angela Davis showed up. It was a very active, engaged debate. Everyone on the Palestinian side was running away from BDS. They were saying, no, we have nothing to do with BDS. We recognize Israel. I think they even ended up in the resolution recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, which I personally wouldn't have done. Uh, they were, it was an albatross. If you really want the movement to succeed, then yes, I agree. It has to be anchored in international law. That is the Palestinian strongest weapon, international law and international legitimacy. Edward Said, in particular, towards the end of his life, uh, he was very shrewd in political questions. Uh, if you read his book um, on the um, uh, uh, peace and its discontents, uh, he says, our strongest card, the thing that's kept our cause alive, is those UN resolutions and international law. It's true. So I think it has to be used as a weapon. But it can't be used as a weapon hypocritically. Uh, because First of all, I don't want to be part of a hypocritical movement personally, but as a political fact, it will never succeed. It can only succeed inside the cult if you're talking to yourself, but before a broad public, it will never succeed because the Israelis have their spokespersons, their people, and they're giving the other side. Uh, but uh, so long as you stay consistent to international law, of course I support boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. I support it before there was a BDS. I used to go annually to the Presbyterian conventions trying to lobby for the Presbyterians to divest for, uh, their uh, investments from Israel and in particular the occupied territories. Of course I support that and of course I support the sanctions. Uh, that's not an issue for me. 
The issue for me is how do you reach the broad public? And you can't possibly reach the broad public uh, if you call for Israel, if you remain silent on or call for Israel's elimination. It's not possible. I don't want to discuss the moral issue, the legal issue. As a political, uh, as a political fact, it's just not possible. It's a dead end, and you end up being confined to a cult. And I don't want to be part of that. I like the broad breezes of a mass movement. I'll tell you the truth. You know what I like? And it's going to sound strange to you, but I was involved in the 1970s, 80s with Israel-Palestine. We used to march down the streets of New York. Everybody should know I support the PLO, very popular in New York in the 1970s, let me tell you. I used to just pray I reached the end of this demonstration alive, and I'm looking for sharpshooters here and there. You know, uh, that's what we did. And, every, and most of the people in the movement, you want to know the, the truth, most of the people in the movement were crazy. They were. You know, uh, I belonged to a group called JMU, Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. It was right after the 1982 Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. Uh, and I used to say, uh, after Sabra and the Shatila, the second biggest catastrophe of the Lebanon war was our group. You know, everybody was insane in that group. <laughs> Maybe me too, I don't know. Uh, uh, but then the movement began to grow. And you were saying, I, used to, I was going on college campuses uh, beginning, you'd say, from 2010 to around 2007, and you were seeing really healthy, happy, together, young people part of the movement. It was very exciting. Normal people were now part of this movement. Uh, it was really a breath of fresh air. And one of the signs that things had changed, they changed their name. In the 70s and 80s, it was called PSCs, Palestine Solidarity Committee. And then it changed its name to SJPs, Students for Justice in Palestine. The, for most of you, maybe you don't even notice the change, but for me it was very striking because originally it was an ethnic issue where you were pro or, pro or anti-Palestinian. But then it became a moral issue. Are you for or against justice? Students for justice in Palestine. And that to me was a very welcome development. Now all I'm hearing is the Israel Apartheid Week. It's now changed to IAW. They call it IAW slash SJP. And they're now trying to turn the whole issue. It's no longer becoming the, the issue of occupation is disappearing from the agenda. The issue has now become Israel is an apartheid state. Not Israeli policies in the West Bank and Gaza are apartheid-like, which they are. But Israel itself is an apartheid state. The whole thing is shifting now towards we have to get rid of Israel. And what's going to inevitably happen is the movement is going to contract and contract and contract. And all those people who we were reaching for a while, we're going to lose them. Uh, I think there's a possibility of, there not only is a possibility, I think for a time it was happening. We were reaching, we were getting into that mainstream. Uh, and you could see it on the college campuses. Uh, but now I have a fear that this whole BDS, Israel is an apartheid state, which means Israel has to be you know, gotten rid of. Um, we're going to go end back. It's going to go full circle to everybody should know I support the PLO. Uh, and I think that's just a disaster. It's a regrettable one, uh, but I think it's a disaster. Please join me in thanking okay. Norman Finkelstein.